Okay, so welcome everyone to the community conversations on taking action for a hydro local future. My name is Charlie Alcorn. I'm a program manager and educator with Watershed Management Group. And we're a nonprofit. We're based in Tucson, Arizona, and we work throughout the Sonoran Desert um, from the Phoenix Valley to Northern Mexico. And our work is you know, doing grassroots projects and education, working to support healthier cities and healthier watersheds. Uh, I'll be, you know, in addition to monitoring or in addition to welcoming you tonight, I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, we do want people to have a chance to ask our panelists questions tonight, uh, and we'd like you to use the chat feature to do that. Um, if you have a question that you want to direct to, to someone in particular, please uh, write their name down or note their name that you want us to, to bring that question to uh, to that person first. Um, and then also, there are many of us in this in the the Zoom. Uh, conversation tonight, so please keep yourself muted. Uh, that lets us hear from our special guests and keeps uh, lets us all hear a little bit better. Um, tonight, we're going to hear representatives from organizations serving communities throughout Tucson and Arizona, um, and they are organizations that are helping people connect to resources to take advantage of our local energy resources and water resources. Um, we hope that from the you know small policy initiatives to resources that you can connect into your neighborhood, we hope you each one of you take home something that you know inspires you to take action in your community. Um, this is, event is part of a larger uh, event. It's the kickoff for the Desert Living Home Tour happening this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 a 3 p.m. Um, and the homes you see on that tour. Are, have all taken small steps or uh, bigger steps to start to make use of our water resources like rainwater, gray water, and also our ener energy resources taking advantage of solar. Um, and so with those homes on the tour and the organizations and the representatives we're hearing from tonight with those organizations, uh, we hope to inspire everyone and show, to show kind of demonstrate a path forward to help us all work towards healthier cities healthier communities. So um, with that, I want to welcome our moderator for the evening, Catalina Ross, with the Sierra Club Grand Canyon chapter. So welcome, Sierra. Or sorry, Catalina. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Charlie. Um, my name is Catalina Ross. I am the Energy Program Coordinator for Southern Arizona uh, Sierra Club Grand Canyon chapter. Um, Sierra Club does a lot of grassroots work on various topics, but especially in Arizona, um, everything from water and Grand Canyon um, to, you know, energy and border uh, ecosystem work. So um, that is kind of how we uh, came into partnership with the Watershed Management Group. Um, we're happy to be here as part of this tour, and this is, I believe, our fourth panel, fourth annual panel. Um, so uh, very exciting to get to talk with the community about these things. Um, I personally work a lot on uh, various policies within Tucson and Arizona in order to help um, push forward an energy future that's going to be off of fossil fuels like coal and gas and onto renewables like solar and wind and storage. Um, and part of that is also encouraging energy, energy efficiency. Um, so that's basically uh, what my work is and I'm happy to be here. Um, I also wanted to give a brief um, uh, a message that as hosts of this event, the Watershed Management Group and Sierra Club both, I uh, wanna take a moment to remember that the lands that uh, upon which our event is taking place, where we call Tucson and Phoenix, are unceded tribal territories which belong to the Tohono Otham, the Akimo Otham, the Yachet Otham, Pasquayaki or Yoema people, and Piposh peoples as well. Um, and the lands and waters we're discussing in Greater Arizona have been home to, sacred to, and stewarded by these and dozens of other local indigenous tribes for millennia. Um, and so that's super important uh, when we're talking about these lands and waters. 
And I think we'll go ahead now and introduce our panelists who we have the pleasure of having with us tonight. Anna, you can go ahead. Thanks, Catalina. Um, good evening, everyone. I am Anna Bettis. I'm the Healthy Cities Program Director for the Nature Conservancy in Arizona. You may be familiar with the Nature Conservancy from our work to conserve ecologically significant lands. Um, about eight years ago, we made the decision to uh, work in urban areas. And so I'm leading that work here in the Phoenix metro area. We do work in about 20 different communities across North America. So that looks a little bit different depending on the, the local context. Um, but here being the hottest large metro area, we do have a big focus on mitigating heat, particularly in communities that are um, disproportionately impacted by urban heat. So we have a tree canopy goal. Um, certainly we can talk about that a little bit later around uh, the water considerations there, but thanks Catalina. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. I'll, I'll jump in and thanks to Sierra Club and the Water Tip Management Group for um, including me and inviting me. Um, my name is Sarah Liguori. Um, I'm an Arizona native. I'm, I'm from Tucson, but I currently represent LD28 and LD5, which is um, the central core of, of Phoenix. And I was on the Commerce and Government and Elections Committee in my first uh, term last year, but I have a passion and interest in all things related to water conservation and climate change. And so as a freshman legislature, I ran um, a, water, a water conservation policy, which I'll you know, be answering and, and deep diving into when I speak, but um, very happy to be here today amongst these other panelists and thank you for including me. Hi everyone, my name is Flor Sandoval and I'm the program director at Sonora Environmental Research Institute. Uh, we go by SERI. SERI is a small nonprofit organization located in Tucson. Uh, we were funded in 1994. I've been with SETI for 14 years. I started as a volunteer and um, I now manage the day-to-day -day operations in most of the programs that we that we have that you're gonna be learning um, a little bit on each one of them today. So thank you. Thank you for being here today. Hey everybody, uh, Brett Fanshaw. I'm the Arizona Program Director with Solar United Neighbors. I'm based in Phoenix and work all across the state. And I've been working on energy and environmental issues in Arizona for 13 years. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Our mission is to help people go solar, join together, and fight for their energy rights. We organize solar co-op groups, which are bulk purchase campaigns for rooftop solar. And we've run about a dozen of those across the state in the last three years and helped hundreds of people go solar with their neighbors. Uh, we provide unbiased vendor neutral information to consumers about solar and help people uh, through the process. And then we also do policy and advocacy work. We make sure we have good local, state, and federal solar policy. Uh, we also encourage energy equity and um, have some low and moderate income solar pilot programs. Uh, and then we also do some work with nonprofits and other institutions to help them go solar. Uh, right now we're running the nonprofit solar project with the Community Foundation for Southern Arizona um, in uh, the Pima County, Tucson area. So really excited to be here. Thanks uh, for to Watership Management Group and Sierra Club for organizing. Thanks, Brett, and thanks uh, to all of you for being here. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump right in so we can take advantage of these expertise while we're here. Um, so our first question is for Anna Bettis. Uh, the Colorado River shortage has created a lot of insecurity uh, in water resources as to allocations and, um, and the future of planning water. Um, this has been exacerbated by climate change, as we know, making Arizona hotter and drier every year. Um, and in the face of these challenges, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what programs the Nature Conservancy has um, to support resiliency and, um, and 
kind of addressing mitigation of climate change as much as possible while we are living here in the desert. Yeah, thanks for that question, Catalina. Um, you know, being in the Phoenix metro area, certainly heat and water are two big things that come to mind um, when we think about the impacts of climate change. Um, for us, a big strategy uh, for adapting to the impacts of climate change, we think is going to be increasing tree canopy cover in our hottest communities. I learned uh, when I got into this role that there's neighborhoods that can be as little as two miles apart and have up to a 13 degree difference in air temperature. And that the hottest communities also have the lowest tree canopy cover and the highest child poverty. So we, we see that the places that um, have the fewest resources to cope with the impacts of climate change um, are really being hit the hardest. And so our work is really focused on um, trying to get cities and private sector and residents to come together to try to increase tree canopy cover. Um, and when we talk about this, uh, really one of the, the big questions I always get is, well, what about the water? And especially with the drought that we're in right now. Um, and so um, when we're promoting this increasing tree canopy cover, I think it's really important to think about using desert adapted trees and green stormwater infrastructure. Um, people may not realize how much water we actually do have here. Um, we've built our cities though in a way that um, it's really hard for water to infiltrate into the ground. We have a lot of impervious surfaces like parking lots and streets. Um, and with our separated sewer system here in the valley, you know, the, the design was let's get the water away from the city as quickly as possible so that we don't have floods in our communities uh, during those big monsoon rains. Um, but we're really missing out because that water, it picks up pollutants along the way and it just uh, pools outside the community and then evaporates and we lose a lot of that precious water resource. And so if we can um, really try to design projects in a way to capture that, um, we think that that can be a really important way to ensure that projects really only have um, minimal supplemental watering needs, especially after the first couple of years. So I would say, um, you know, for people thinking about what their role could be, certainly, um, using green stormwater infrastructure like swales and basins really can do something as simple. I know Watershed Management Group does their build your own basin. It doesn't have to be overly complicated, um, but adding that tree canopy, particularly in places that can shade pedestrian areas, I think is really important. You know, those places that people are going from home to transit stops, you can get the shade for your yard, but you can also get the shade uh, to benefit your community. There's kind of a co-benefit there. Um, and then some things that the Nature Conservancy is doing to support these um, efforts. We have partnered with a number of different organizations, including Watershed Management Group on a program called the Urban Heat Leadership Academy. It's really aimed at building the capacity of community residents to implement solutions to heat, advocate for solutions to heat. Um, and that program is a five month long program offered in Spanish and in English. And then um, graduates are eligible for small grants and mentorships to actually carry out projects in their communities. So we're really trying to build up the, the capacity of people living in these hotter neighborhoods to, um, to implement and advocate for those solutions. Thanks. Thank you. That is amazing. Um, such a breadth of work that you guys are doing in the community. And um, I love that you are dually uh, addressing both the heat and the uh, water at the same time. Um, a quick follow-up question to that is, uh, do you have ways that you are connecting folks that you're working with um, on the grassroots level up into city or county um, uh, policies? Yeah, so we, um... I would say we have kind of two levels of our work. We have our grassroots work, which are things like the Urban Heat Leadership Academy, and then what I might call grass tops work to try to really get more investment from cities um, and from the private sector. And so we've done some work that, um, that targets that more grass tops area, like an economic assessment of heat that said, you know, what will the impacts to our economy be if we don't take action? And what's the cost and benefits of solutions like urban tree canopy? Um, I would say the, the connection there, um, actually, funny enough, right before this call, 
um, uh, an opportunity to connect those two pieces came up. We're looking for ways that we can plug in our Urban Heat Leadership Academy graduates to um, speak out, to advocate for more investment in um, heat mitigation. So for example, um, if anyone is interested, the city of Phoenix and their uh, their upcoming bond is planning to um, include, I think it's about $7 million uh, for, for urban heat mitigation work. So anyone who's interested in you know, making a public comment in support of that, so sharing opportunities like that with the, um, the graduates of the Urban Heat Leadership Academy, that's it's a new area for us. We've only um, been in this space for a couple of years, but we're we're always looking for ways to to connect the two. So if anyone's interested or has ideas on that, um, I think there'll be slides later with our our email. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Very cool. Um, so the next question will be uh, to Sarah Ligori, and kind of taking this uh, zooming out from city and to state, um, we, can you tell us a little bit about what was passed related to water harvesting and uh, water conservation uh, just this year in the House Bill 2812? I, I can, and um, I'll give you a little background um, because it morphed over time in a, in a wonderful way. So um, I mirrored the, the piece of legislation I wrote off of the city of Tucson. They've been doing this rainwater harvesting program for 10 plus years it's run seamlessly and it just seems like common sense practice to me once I became familiar with it that I thought everyone in the state should have a chance um, to access this type of wonderful program. So um, I ran the bill and um, I think it would have passed on its own merit. It did get out of the Senate with unanimous approval, um, but what it became was Senate Bill 1740. So it morphed into, I asked for a million dollars specific to rainwater harvesting to do a test pilot program so that um, you know, homeowners um, could access up to $500 for passive rainwater uh, management systems, landscaping, things of that nature, or up to $2,000 for active rainwater harvesting systems, which would be cisterns and tanks. Um, what it became was, you know, through really persistent negotiations from the Democrats, was $200 million towards water conservation products, uh, pro excuse me, projects. So SB 1740 uh, created WIFA, the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority. And then it also created inside of that, um, the board that is going to be overseeing all of these conservation um, group funds and projects. So rainwater harvesting became a sliver um, and I can touch on all of the other um, programs that got involved in that now or, or in another question. Um, but rainwater harvesting now became part of $200 million of funds that are accessible to programs, um, cities, towns, municipalities to then go and start to run these conservation efforts um, and fund them wholly through the state. Got it. Thank you. Um, and so it sounds like there's funding in there for both individuals to use and for cities to use. Um, so the next question is how can cities and people apply or get access to the grant funding? Yeah, great question. So before I tell you who can get it, let me tell you who can't get it. So within this fund, um, it's not available to tribal or for individual use. And, and the tribal has its own $20 million set aside. So they're not excluded from this. They just have their own individual pot of money. Um, so the program will be, um, it will have a, it's under WIFA, it will have a governing board where it runs the projects through. And right now it's in the process of setting that up. And once that is established, we're looking at probably first quarter of um, 2023, um, cities, towns, counties, districts, commissions, authorities, um, any public entity under statute, um, charter or initiative can access this money, any um, conservation, um, group, so a non-governmental organization that's focused on water conservation, that's focused on environmental production, if they partner with a public entity, they can have access to the funds too. So we left it very broad in, in, in scope, although it has to be run through a public or a, a partner non-government agency focused in conservation. Um, once that money is there, they will apply for it. You need to, so let's say the city of Tucson says, we want to expand our, our gray water systems. They'll apply for a, a million dollar grant 
um, of which they need to put up 25% of the money. So there is a 25% match that, that the um, organizations will have to put up. Once that is established um, through the city or town or whatever it might be, then that program will be instituted and run through the board. So then that is when the individuals come in and say, okay, city of Tucson, you now have this you know, program, I'd like to participate in it. And they will directly apply and, and coordinate with them. So um, it's, there's a timeline and that's why you know, it keeps getting pushed out, I would say about six months, but uh, I, this might lead into the next question um, of you know, how are we gonna go about communicating this? So right now, um, I'm trying to get with organizations, you know, like yourself, getting in front of city council members, getting in front of um, conservation water groups, um, you know, city councils, AMWA, the Department of Water Resources, and just saying, hi, we need to start thinking about, A, what programs might align with what you would like to do, how much money, and where is that funding going to come from, so that when the time has come, when the boards are set, when WIFA is established, when the money is in the bank account, um, then the groups can go and say, we would like to apply for this. And then the citizens can say, okay, we would like to participate in this program too. So I would say we're looking at probably six to nine months before you know, me, Mr. Um, homeowner can go and, and get my rainwater harvesting tank paid for you know, through this fund. Got it. Um, and so that does uh, address one of the next of things the next thing. that we were talking about. Um, uh, how do we prepare our cities to take advantage of the programs? Um, so it sounds like city council is a great way to, to start talking about them in our cities. Is there anything else you can think of off the bat that would be helpful? Um, I, I'm trying to coordinate, you know, an effort on my own um, with uh, the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority will be they're working on, you know, for I will call it a roadshow. Um, so they're going to be going out and talking to groups, to cities, to towns, to counties, letting them know, you know, what the process and procedure is and the scope of the program. So what I'm trying to do is, is work with my fellow legislators to, you know, disseminate this information to their districts, to their organizations. Um, if you know anyone that might be interested, you know, be happy to talk to them, but then we will get a heavy lift from, you know, water centric groups in the state that are also going to go out because we want this money to be used. We want this to be um, communicated um, so that we can um, make it very accessible and easy once the infrastructure um, is finalized. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, I'll remind everybody that uh, we are going to have resources to share with folks about um, these various programs you're hearing about um, after the panel's over, and we will have some time for questions at the end too. Um, and to Catalina, dive a little more in. Hmm? One thing before, oh, go ahead. before, yeah, if you don't mind, I just wanted to give everyone on the call um, an idea of the scope of the projects um, so they can start to think of what might be you know, efficient for their homes. So the, the 200 million that's there can go into any sort of education or research program on ways to conserve, reduce water consumption, increase water efficiency, increase water reuse, um, rainwater harvesting, gray water systems, efficiency upgrades, plumbing fixtures, landscaping, um, turf removal, um, we left the language in the policy very broad in, in scope because we, we want it to be used as you know, water and other conservation groups see fit. But um, those are the type of projects that homeowners will be able to take advantage of once this is established. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know that you had mentioned it earlier and I forgot to come back to it, um, but thank you. Um, sounds like there's a lot that we're going to be able to use in that, and it's amazing that we that you were able to help get this passed and um, write such a, a, a good legislation to address our times, as it were. <laughs> um, our next question is going to be for Floor Sandoval um, about your work with Sari. Um, Sari is working with homeowners promoting water conservation, renewable energy, and community health. Um, can you share a little bit more about those programs and who you're serving? Sure. So, um, like I mentioned before, we work primarily in Southern Metropolitan Tucson, 
uh, but we focus primarily on low income and marginalized communities. Um, we have a wide variety of programs right now that go from water conservation. We have been working on rainwater harvesting for about six, seven years now. We develop a program to be able to uh, bring rainwater harvesting to low income communities. As Sarah was mentioning, um, Chisholm Water has had a rebate program for a long time. So a lot of participants have been able to benefit from, from the rebate, but unfortunately low income communities were not. So uh, we were able to pilot a program, get some funding, and uh, now we have established rainwater harvesting program for limited income families. So what we're doing is we're covering the at from cost of the rainwater harvesting installations, and we're giving participants, um, we're helping them file the rebate, and also uh, we're giving them a grant for up to $750. And if they have a balance after that, we're able to provide a 0% interest loan for up to 12 months. And the loans can be as high as $2,000. Um, we also, as part of the water conservation program, we are working with Tucson, closely with Tucson Water to add uh, two new programs to, to our water conservation programs. We're gonna be adding the gray water program uh, so we're also going to be helping homeowners in, and we also help renters. So we also help renters as long as um, the homeowner or the landlord is willing to participate in the program. So the way it works, the renter has to ask the landlord, and if they say yes, uh, we can go ahead and, and qualify them and they can participate. Um, but then, so we're going to be including the green water program in a high efficiency clothes washer program. That's one of the programs that. The gray water, we're still working, finalizing the program, but the high efficiency clothes washers, it's almost ready. And hopefully it's gonna be launching the couple in the next couple of months. We're gonna be replacing all clothes washers because Tucson Water also has a rebate program to replace clothes washers where um, people can get up to $200 if they replace their old um, high water use clothes washer for a new, uh, higher efficiency clothes washer. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be covering the cost of those clothes washers and the participants will only be responsible for $200 of the cost of the clothes washer and we're going to be giving them 0% interest loans for six months. This, this will be a little shorter, but also the amount is not that big. Then we also have, that's our water conservation programs. And we also have a healthy home program where we go into the home and we do a 29 hazard evaluation. And right now we're partnering with the city of Tucson to conduct the lead hazard control program. So if we've had homes that are built pre-1978, we're able to refer them to the lead hazard control program and the city comes in to do the lead testing and it's a lead abatement program. Um, we also have a fair housing education and outreach program. So we're doing fair housing classes and we have established a fair housing hotline for uh, people that are going to, that are suffering fair housing issues. They can give us a call and we will refer them to Southwest Fair Housing Council for um, fair housing assistance. Um, we also have uh, the business assistance program. We're working with small businesses, especially mechanic shops and beauty salons to reduce BOC levels at the shop. Uh, and finally, we have the sustainable energy program, which has two parts to it. We have um, one of the newest programs too that it's going to be launched in the next couple of weeks. It's the energy efficiency improvement improvements program. So we're it's uh, city funding, and we're going to be going into the homes and we're able to uh, to do some energy retrofits. So people, I mean, we have funding to assist 56 families and they can get up to $2,000 in, in grants and up to $2,000 in loans for 10 families. And lastly, we have our solar empowerment program, which we pilot after the rainwater harvesting program that we have. Um, we are working closely with Technicians for Sustainability. It's a joint program. And we're, we're doing the same that we're doing for the rainwater harvesting. So we're covering, um, we're referring 
the participants to technicians for sustainability. We go into their homes and since we're, it's a partnership program with TFS, um, someone from SERI and someone from TFS are going to the homes and TFS is giving them a quote in place. And SERI uh, covers 50, up to 50% of the cost of the solar system, the rooftop solar system in the home. And then the remaining 50%, we assist the families get a loan through two different banks that TFS currently uses. They also have opportunities to provide their own funding, but that's some, sometimes a barrier that they face. And so, yeah, we're, we're looking to expand that program as well. And we're working with the city of Tucson and um, we're gonna be receiving uh, some additional funding to be able to expand this program. So I'm, I'm very excited and looking forward for that. Thank you so much. That is incredible, all of that amazing work you're doing. Um, and you touched on something that I wanted to open to our panelists. We have uh, all of you are doing work on um, energy and water equity um, and trying to enable um, more of these resources to get to low income and limited income housing. Um, I'm, the question is, um, do you feel like the programs are effective? And are you feeling like uh, there are challenges that we could uh, be addressing perhaps better or maybe as residents uh, in the city? And I'll let you go uh, ahead first, um, Flor. Sure, thank you. So I think the programs are working and every day we are seeing more and more programs making it more accessible, but um, there's still a lot that we can do. Uh, there's still a lot of barriers to get to low income communities. Uh, we try to focus on making uh, everything bilingual. So if we're gonna be offering a workshop, we also offer it in English and Spanish at this time. We're slowly including other, other languages. We are, um, reliable uh, agency or friendly reliable agency so they can call us if they need to um, if they're hard of hearing they, we can also assist them with that I forgot the exact exact wording for it but I'll, I'll look it up so I think there's still a lot of opportunities to to get to the families to get to low-income communities what I often see is that uh, sometimes we assume that everybody has internet access and that's not necessarily the case or that everybody is able to apply online. In primarily working with SETI, we use uh, or we do a lot of uh, promoting in the community. So we go out, we go door to door, giving the information face to face. And I think that's really effective. And that's something that unfortunately with the pandemic, we were not able to do. So we have to rely online, but we're slowly going back to the community to make sure that they're getting the information that they need and in the language that they that it's more convenient for them. So I think that's that's key in order to make the resources more accessible. Yeah, the follow up is so important as well. Um, such a good point there. Um, if anyone else has uh, some words they'd like to add to this one, please feel free. I, I think this is Brad. I, I think I would just add, so we have a similar program to, to SERI that we piloted in, in Tucson with TFS last year. It's a similar structure to pay for about half the cost of a solar array, and we've got seven participants going through that that program. And I think to, to Flor's point on you know, scaling that up with the city is a big opportunity. Like there are these pilot projects that uh, a lot of people have spent a lot of time figuring out like how to get them to work. And now there's a lot of them that we should be thinking about. How can we scale up? How can we raise more money? How can we build capacity to get them to more more people and more households and more places? Um, like for example, there's no there's no program like that in the Phoenix area or really anywhere else in the state of Arizona. So how can we expand some of these offerings to similar households in other, in other places? Certainly, and I'd love to hear Anna's thoughts on this as well in the Valley. 
sorry, Catalina, can you repeat the question? I think since there's been a couple of answers, I've lost track of the original. <laughs> oh, no problem. Um, I was just um, asking what the whether the low income programs um, uh, seem to be reaching who they need to be. Um, and Brett uh, took that question and kind of um, expanded into how do we scale these programs up once they once a really good program has already been made um, and noted that in the in Phoenix there aren't programs like the ones that uh, that Solar United Neighbors and Sari have for solar. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to the specifics of, yeah, uptake on particular programs in low-income communities, but what I can say in the way that we've been able to do our work in low-income communities has been partnering with community-based organizations who have trusted relationships in those neighborhoods. Um, for example, in the Urban Heat Leadership Academy, we partnered to co-develop the program with Phoenix Revitalization Corporation. And so the whole design and approach, um, we were able to work with them to ensure that it was culturally appropriate, that it was accessible to anybody, regardless if you have a formal education or not. So some of the, the design uh, decisions that came out of that, for example, is we have a series of couple of minute long animated videos, like just thinking about the way that people learn in these communities and the value that having that trusted community-based organization partner who knows how to reach those people, um, that's been really important. And those, those partners for us have also been organizations that are representative of the communities that we're trying to reach. And so that's been really um, critical as well. So for us, you know, I, I haven't actually had to do any outreach. I'm more kind of behind the scenes. And it's really our, our partners who have those relationships who take the lead on that. So that would be my response on kind of how to how to be effective in reaching out to those those low income communities. Yeah, I love that you point out the importance of organizing, uh, maybe just because I'm an organizer, but uh, I think that it's really important to get, you know, all of our uh, partnerships um, working together instead of having a piecemeal approach uh, for everything. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, take that question since we were hearing from Brett already um, and ask him about the work that Solar United Neighbors is doing, um, which uh, firstly, what is a solar co-op? How would, how do you start one um, in your neighborhood? And what are the community benefits uh, of a solar co-op? And then lastly, how do you quantify whether they're being effective? Yeah, I'll, uh, I will work to get to all, all of those and thank you so much. So, uh, well, first off is to, to us and our programs, a solar co-op is essentially a group of people in a geographic area coming together to install rooftop solar at the same time. So some of our co-op groups start super organically. There's a leader in the neighborhood and they you know, get 10 or 20 of their neighbors on board and then we kind of grow it out from there. Um, all of our uh, co-op programs have community uh, partners, which range from you know, local neighborhood associations or community groups uh, to nonprofits. And then we also work with uh, municipalities to help them meet their climate action targets in some cases. And so uh, you know, kind of what we do is we manage the signups and, and then facilitate the bidding process to uh, have the members select a solar company to work with. So kind of once that group gets to like 30 to 50 households, we bid it out to uh, solar companies. And then we help the group members look through those bids and they among themselves pick which company based on the bids that they want to work with. So um, everybody gets an individual proposal based on that group rate. So the co-op is really about buying power. Some people confuse it with sharing energy, but it's really just about that group sort of purchasing model. Um, and then, you know, our co-ops are free to join and the installers pay us a small fee for every participant that signs a contract and goes forward to that helps fund our work. So as far as the, the benefits go, 
um, you know, this process usually provides people that go through it with a discounted price um, on solar because they're going solar with a whole set of other folks and the installers have competed for the business. Um, we provide folks with unbiased and vendor neutral support through the process because we're not, you know, linked to any solar company or any financing uh, firm, but just trying to provide people information to make a decision for themselves. Um, and so folks can kind of call or email us at any point if they're, you know, having trouble with the installer, getting in touch with them, they have a question about the proposal or the pricing. Um, and then overall, we try to like, you know, also bring people together, create community, create shared learning opportunities. Uh, it's a, it can be like a daunting or confusing technology for folks. Like it's a great idea, but um, some to some people, the it, it can be intimidating. And so we do a lot of community education and then also like connecting people with their neighbors that know about it or someone that's gone through the process before. And so there's a lot of like cool shared learning and that's expanded into like, oh, I've got solar and now I'm interested in battery storage and how does that work and when should I use it? And what, what are the kinds that you like and how does it work if I wanna get an electric vehicle at some point? So there's kind of lots of cool emerging technology questions that sort of filter into uh, the work we do. And just to get to the last part of the question, so we, we measure several outcomes in our process. So one is just, you know, how many people sign up for the co-op uh, how many people actually install uh, a system because um, there's no requirement that people do that. They can just get the information and decide it's not for them. Um, you know, how many megawatts of solar uh, have we installed? Uh, how many battery systems, EV chargers, and then like the dollars invested in the community through the program is also something we track. So like what's the economic impact of this particular group um, and how much money are people going to save based on sort of projections over time. We also have a jobs calculator um, that calculates how many solar jobs we've created through doing this type of work. And then uh, obviously we're here for sustainability reasons. So we also track the emissions reductions uh, throughout the lifetime of the, the system. So there's, there, there's a really cool dashboard that we use um, that kind of like we can pull it for any, uh, the collective, uh, impact of the co-ops are just like one particular co-op in one spot. Wow, that's so many metrics. Um, and I would follow that with, do you feel like it has been effective or as effective as you had hoped? And is there any way that the Inflation Reduction Act that was just passed um, this year federally um, going to help with those efforts? Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be enormous. The Inflation Reduction Act has so many great things for for solar. And I, I guess just to say on, you know, how effective it's been so far, like we're we have more demand than we can handle. And I think that that's the case also for the solar industry generally. And like we need to sort of scale up capacity because you know, a lot of people are waiting a long time to, <laughs> to get solar, or having a hard time finding a good contractor. So we're, we're seeing like a big, a big amount of demand. And I think that that's going to, that's really going to continue with the Inflation Reduction Act. It expands and extends the solar tax credit. So solar tax credits back to 30% uh, starting this year for the next 10 years. Um, that's great news. Um, something we fought really hard for in there is a uh, called direct pay. And this is gonna be a game changer for nonprofit organizations, municipalities, and others that um, do not have a tax liability can get an equal, something equal to the tax credit, but just through a mechanism called direct pay, where it's basically a rebate um, from the federal government for that 30% cost. So, it's, so, so they're gonna be able to access that incentive just uh, which has not been possible. And that starts next year for installations starting next year. So we're really excited about that. Um, it also expands a popular program called uh, REAP, which is Rural Energy for America program. It's run by the Department of Agriculture. And um, that provides grants to rural small businesses and um, uh, agricultural producers so that they can install solar with an incentive as well. So there's a ton of other stuff in there on like home electrification and like storage and everything else. But uh, just in terms of solar, that's, that's just, those are sort of the highlights. 
That's helpful. Thank you. I know there is a ton in that act, um, and I encourage folks to um, look inside your uh, flyer, um, your brochure for the tour, where um, there is a page near the beginning uh, that has a Sierra Club logo on it, and it has some different um, clickable links where you can learn more about uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, okay, one last question, and then we'll switch into, I'd love for each of you to um, please uh, provide us a, an action that folks can take at home. But the last question before that is, uh, what would you say for folks who don't own their own home? And if we could just get to one or two answers on that from people, anybody who has thoughts. I'll, I'll jump in, but just piggybacking on, you know, what some of the other panelists said that have been, um, you know, directly already working in this space. And that was a question I came to the watershed management group in the city of Tucson for, and, and they're exploring that. I've also talked to, you know, had round tables of, um, you know, landlords and, and, you know, letting them know what the benefits are. And if you could get this paid for, you know, could you incorporate this into your you know, housing projects. So you're doing some um, water conservation, you're passing that benefit off to your um, tenants. So I'm hoping that we can continue those discussions with individual um, homeowners that are renting out their homes in different capacities, just on the greater good of what, you know, water conservation will do for us in this state. But um, I know that there are a lot of organizations, um, you know, and Flora was discussing that of how do we open it up so it's not just you know you own your own home? I think that I've you know also renters have I've talked to different renters that have gone to their landlords that have installed some of the rainwater harvesting tanks for them under the premise that you know you get almost hundred percent of it paid for. So exploring those conversations, I think if you are a tenant or if you are renting right now with your landlord, um, you know is I think we're opening up the door to those. To having that conversation um, and broadening it outside of just individual homeowners. And did anyone else want to jump in on that one? Well, I was just going to add, um, like I said, we do work with renters. Um, we don't have many renters, but if I can recall correctly, most of the participants that come to us that qualify for the program and are renting, we haven't had any issues with the landlords wanting to, to get rainwater harvesting systems for their homes. Um, but I think that's something to, to keep talking about. And unfortunately for the solar program, uh, right now it is only for homeowners for on our program. But hopefully that's something that we can change in the future. Thank you. Um, oh, Anna, I see you're unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I guess I was just gonna highlight that um, even if you can't do something on the property that you live on, um, you can still speak out to get more investment from you know decision makers like your city council when um, the budgeting process is happening. So um, you know there can still be a role to play even if your particular property you know can't have a project happen on. Maybe your landlord is not open to doing something like that. Um, there's a lot of you know city-owned properties that you know you could advocate that more trees be put into your community or. Um, you know, rainwater harvesting features. So just wanted to to highlight there's always there's always something that that you can do. Absolutely. Um, and speaking of things that we can do, I'll uh, go in the circle here and ask if each of you would um, just spend one minute uh, giving folks an action or two that they could do um, at home to support this work. Uh, start with uh, you, Sarah. Um, thank you so much. Um, so I would say um, take what 
everyone here is in, you know, that's on this call right now um, is engaged and informed and, and wants to do something more. And from me working in this space, um, it's so great to meet such like-minded people. And the more we have these conversations and, and can collaborate and see that there's a lot more of us that want to do these conservation and energy sustainability things, I think there's power in numbers there. So continue to show up and talk in those spaces. Um, I will say continue to speak up to you know, your city council members, to your state legislatures, continue to put um, you know, climate change and energy resiliency and you know, water conservation and, and heat issues um, into your elected officials or decision makers so that they know how top of mind it is for members of our community. Um, when I started talking about rainwater harvesting to constituents, it was amazing to me how many are, are like, I already do that. I've been wanting to do that. My cousin does it, my neighbor does it. And so I think spearheading just a lot of those conversations and keeping the urgency and importance of what we're discussing here tonight um, in front of you know decision makers um, and officials is is one of the most powerful things we can do. So just keep continuing to show up and learn and 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 do what we can. And I really think that if a lot of us do a little bit, we'll really start to move the needle. But until you know some you know elected officials feel that pressure from you know their constituents, they might just think. You know, when I brought this piece of policy, no one was really terribly concerned with water. And now it's, you know, what everyone's front top of mind is. And I think it's just they're hearing from the public how important this topic is and how much we need to, you know, devote attention and focus to it. So that's what, that would be my takeaway from everyone on the call tonight. Thank you. I can go next. So, um, for our rainwater harvesting classes, we always focus on Brad Lancaster's principles. And the first principle is to start small and simple. So that will be my advice for everybody. Like we can start small and simple. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, anything big. We, if we are ready for rainwater harvesting, if we already have trees, we can start doing small basins around them. Um, it doesn't have to be a very expensive system. We can do it ourselves. I know because at the beginning of our rainwater harvesting program, I was doing the rainwater harvesting systems at the home with one of my coworkers. So I, I know it's doable. And also, um, yeah, keep keep raising your voices. Thank you. Thank you, Claude. Well, hey, you stole mine. I was going to say start, start small. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I would also agree with Sarah's point as well about, you know, making your voice known. I think that the more that um, the more that our representatives know that it's a priority for their constituents, I think the more change that we're going to see, you know, the the city of Phoenix created the first publicly funded Office of Heat Response and Mitigation after a lot of community members uh, voiced their um, voice that heat was a big priority for them. And so I think that um, those those public comments go a, a really long way. And then I guess if I could say one other thing, starting small, kind of what I mentioned earlier, I always think it's really great if we can um, really think about how if you are a homeowner, you know, and that's not the case for everyone, or if, you're, if your landlord is uh, really flexible, um, you know, planting trees strategically can really reduce your energy costs and can also provide shade for surrounding communities. So um, that would be something that I uh, would come to top of mind for me. Thank you. Um, I guess I can try to tie tie a couple of things together. I have I have a simple call to action that is also contacting your elected officials, which I'll just I'll share here in the chat, but I'll give a little context. So we are in the midst of an effort at the Arizona Corporation Commission, which is our energy regulators, to establish something called community solar. 
which would allow um, renters or people that can't put or don't want to put solar on their homes to be able to subscribe to a shared community solar array. Um, but that's something that the um, Corporation Commission has to enable and direct the regulated utilities to do. Um, and they could vote on it as early as three weeks from now. So I'm going to throw a uh, petition in the chat. And if you want to sign it, we're going to file it in the docket. And if you want some more information, I'm happy to follow up. We have a couple, we have lots of resources and some webinar recordings that we've done recently if you want to do like a deeper dive on this uh, topic. But excited about that. And it's actually not the same as community choice energy or community choice aggregation. It's a different, it's something different, Catalina. Oh. So, oh, okay. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Just with our right. last text. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and and both of those, uh, you can look into into both of those community choice energy and um, community solar. Uh, and uh, signing Brett's petition is uh, definitely a great start and an easy action that folks can take now. Um, I want to say thank you again so much to all the panelists for being here. Um, I apologize we went a little long, um, but it's just so much knowledge to try to, you know, harness and share with folks and it's never quite enough time, unfortunately, but uh, I think we've got your contact information that we're putting up on the screen and folks can go ahead and write that down or take a screenshot and uh, let uh, let people know if you've got questions, follow up with our panelists. Um, and with that, I think we will take some audience questions, but it will take us over a little bit, uh, maybe up to 10 minutes. And, um, and then after that, we are happy to answer more questions via email. Um, so thank you again, everyone for coming. And uh, if you need to hop off now, have a great night. And thanks, Catalina, for moderate, moderating this conversation. Um, I was monitoring the chat, and thank you to the panelists for sharing everything um, tonight, but also for, for engaging people on the chat. A lot of questions were answered uh, through conversations there. Um, there were a few questions I wanted to, to bring up to let people expand a little bit more on, and a few that we didn't capture in the chat. Um, and one, I th Anna, you answered this in the chat, but could you talk a little bit about a, maybe an intersection or, or work trying to address flood mitigation as well as just you know rainwater harvesting and, and supporting vegetation through through flood mitigation where those two things intersect. Yeah, so I put a little bit of information in the chat. Um, we did the Nature Conservancy um, partnered with the Bureau of Reclamation, the City of Phoenix, um, Maricopa Flood Control District, Maricopa Air Quality Department, and ASU, lots of uh, different roles on that project, um, to look at, at different levels of application um, features, low impact development features, so those that infiltrate um, rainwater closer to where it falls, we're using the terms I think LID and green stormwater infrastructure somewhat uh, synonymously here, um, but looking at what the potential benefits could be um, at different levels of implementation. And so basically that study demonstrated, it was theoretical, so it was modeling of what, if we did this, what, what would happen? Um, uh, but basically it demonstrated that at all the levels of implementation that there were, um, flood risk mitigation benefits. So the um, the amount of water that was uh, left over on site to, to, to leave that site uh, was lower. Um, the quality of the water was better because it was being infiltrated and cleaned. Um, the air quality was better and there were also heat benefits. So the temperature was cooler. And so, um, so yeah, when we're thinking about um, you know things like rainwater harvesting, particularly uh, features that are helping water to infiltrate into the ground, like basins, um, you have that benefit of um, being able to use that water for maybe trees or vegetation, 
Uh, but then you're also reducing the risk of flooding um, on that site. So, um, you know, we don't always think about flooding, but if you've lived in the greater Phoenix area for any amount of time, you know, we do actually have some flooding issues in those monsoon rains. We've all seen those streets that look like, um, look like rivers for, <laughs> for a short while. Uh, so, um, yeah, yeah, thanks for, for raising that. Thanks, Anna. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. The, the, everyone's, uh, our panelists' contact information will be shared in an email, but I just wanna make sure I'm able to look at the questions that we were fielding. Um, one question uh, that came up that I think maybe anyone could, could uh, look at answering is um, just the idea of starting in, is it preferable to start in larger municipalities through you know, these programs, or is it better to start with you know, pilot things in smaller cities and then build up to a municipality? So big communities and start the effort there or, or small communities and build up? Or is there a, is there a benefit either way? Well, I, I think I can talk a little bit about that. Just from the, ex, the from experience on the rainwater harvesting program, as I was saying, we we were um we went on to get some EPA funding to be able to pilot that program together with the Bureau of Applied Research Anthropology at U of A. So and we were able to begin very small. We only did 17 installations the first year of the pilot program. And it was actually only loans, but we conducted a lot of focus groups to be able to develop a program that the community wanted. And locally for us, that has worked. That's how now, after seven years later, we are taking that same module in implementing the, the solar program. And now we have established program with the city of Tucson to do the rainwater harvesting. So hopefully that's also what's gonna happen with the solar program. If not us, another company or another um, business can take it and module our, our program. So, but I, I also think, so that has worked for us. We're a small um, community organization and we have been able to implement small programs and make, it, make them grow. But I think that if the city has the ability and the possibility to uh, start the program, I think that's also something great that they can, if they can do, if they have the uh, ability and the, all the resources to do it, I don't see why it should uh, stop them from doing it. So both things will work. Awesome, thank you. Anyone else wanna share thoughts? I guess I, I was gonna uh, jump in here. I, I wouldn't say there's maybe a right answer to that question because I think there's, there's needs in all um, communities. I, I was just gonna say sort of what we've done, we, we were new in this space. And so when, we, when the Nature Conservancy started working in Greater Phoenix, um, for us, it was really important to look at what was already happening and what role we could play in filling something that wasn't to help advance a lot of the work that was already going on. So I guess something that um, I like to think about a lot is, you know, you don't want to come in wherever you're doing and assume that uh, you're the first one. Usually there's others who have already started to work in whatever issue you're, you're, you're working on. So for us, it was thinking about how we can be a real strategic partner to help uplift and advance um, work for, that other organizations have have already started. Like, what is our role in that in that um, that system? So we started working more closely with City of Phoenix. Now we're trying to move to nine other large cities in the valley. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I, I wouldn't say there's a value judgment on uh, city size. I'm not sure uh, there there's maybe a right right answer i think it yeah it just depends on sort of the work that we're that we're doing thanks anna it's a great perspective and so two quick questions for sarah um oh did sarah have to jump off 
Okay. Then we will save those. And so we did share Sarah's contact information. So um, if people do have questions for her, please reach out. And Kathleen, I should I pass back? I look forward to <laughs> I look forward to um, continuing to to work and communicate with you guys. Um, and I hope everyone enjoys the tour and gets out there on Sunday and uh, goes out and sees all of this stuff in action. Uh, Charlie, it looks like you're back. If you want to say anything in closing. Yeah, well, first, thank you, Catalina, for, for moderating, and thank you to all the panelists for joining us tonight, sharing your expertise, sharing your perspective. Um, and just to, I guess, a, a few of us are fans of this phrase, is start simple. You know, take, take what you heard tonight um, and start with one conversation with a neighbor. Take what you see over the weekend touring the home. Take one idea and try and apply it in your home um, and go from there. So yeah, really appreciate everyone and uh, for being here and, and hope you have a great weekend and uh, tour in the homes. Thank you, thank you, Charlie and Catalina for putting everything together and for inviting us and making us part of the conversation. Have a wonderful yeah, thanks, rest Laura. of your night. Have a good night. Bye. Thanks, Laura. Good night, everyone. Bye, thank everyone. you so much. Bye.